Gaily bedight, a gallant knight, in sunshine and in shadow, had journeyed long, singing a song in search for El Dorado. As his strength failed him at length, he met a pilgrim shadow. Shadow, said he, where can it be? This land called El Dorado. Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow, ride, boldly ride, the shade replied, if you seek for El Dorado. That's El Dorado by Edgar Allan Poe. And that was my first introduction to uh, Poe many, many years ago when I was in the fourth grade. And um, it was an absolute thrill being introduced to Edgar Allan Poe. I'd never heard of him till that time. And uh, it was just a love affair right there. I just fell in love with his work. I remember that afternoon also reading, and this was in, at uh, the Charles V. Carroll School down at the North End where there is no more Charles V. Carroll School. Uh, I was in the fourth grade and I remember reading that afternoon um, The Telltale Heart and it just captured my imagination and it just held its grip and after all these years it's never let go. I just fell in love with the story. And um, for those of you who are not too familiar with The Telltale Heart, it is actually be based upon an actual incident that Edgar Allan Poe came across. He was an avid reader of, of newspapers, of magazines, of everything, and he came across this very interesting story that took place in Salem, Mass, of a man who killed his employer and buried the body, hid it away, and he got a, would have gotten away with it. And um, no one knows why, but months and months after the, uh, the murder, he came forward and admitted to the deed. And uh, this story fascinated Poe, and the story of the telltale heart was the result. Um, whether the real incident was brought on, uh, uh, the admission of guilt was brought on by a supernatural cause, who knows in the, in the actual story, but Poe put this particular spin on it um, when he wrote The Telltale Heart, that it could be the supernatural or it could be the man's guilt that makes him come forward and admit his deed. And it's the most curious story. We know neither the, the names of the, uh, the protagonist or the antagonist, and um, we don't even know uh, the, uh, the killer's real gender. Um, it's never mentioned in the, in the story. A lot of it is left floating in the air, and it just adds to the mystery of this particular tale. And so now, without further ado, uh, I'd like to present the telltale heart. True. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am, but... <laughs> Why will you say that I'm mad? The disease had, had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I, I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I, I heard many things in hell. <laughs> how then am I mad? Hearken and observe how, how healthily, how, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but, but once conceived it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I, I loved the old man. He had, he had never wronged me. He had, he had never given me insult. For his gold I, I had no desire. I, I think it was his, his eye. Yes, it was. It was this, he had the, the eye of a vulture, a, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and, and so by degrees, very gradually, I, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. <laughs> now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what, what caution, with, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night at midnight, I entered his room with a lantern. 
and I open the door all oh, so carefully, just so much for a lantern to go in. And then when my head was well within the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh so cautiously, cautiously for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. But it was impossible to do the deed, for the eye was always closed. And so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man that vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, as the day broke, I, I went boldly into his chamber and called him by name, and I spoke to him in a hearty tone, inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a profound old man indeed to have suspected that, that every night, just at midnight, I, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A, a watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. <laughs> to think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. <laughs> I fairly chuckled at the idea and... And perhaps he heard me because he moved upon the bed suddenly as if startled. Now, you may think I drew back, but oh, oh no, no. You see, the room was as black as pitch, filled with a thick darkness, for the shutters were closed, fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew he could not see me opening up the door, and so I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. When I was well within the room, I resided to unlock the lantern. But then suddenly my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in the bed crying out, Who's there? For a whole hour I did not move a muscle. I just stood there, listening, listening. I knew he had not laid back down in the bed. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, listening, just as I had done night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not the groan of pain or of grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew that sound well, too. Many a night, just after midnight, when all the world slept and it welled up within my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echoes the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man was feeling, and I, I pitied him. <laughs> although, although I chuckled at heart. <laughs> I knew he'd been lying awake ever since that first light noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He'd been trying to fancy them causeless, but he could not. He'd been saying to himself, it was nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a, a cricket that has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found them all in vain, all in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of this unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, though he neither saw nor heard, but to feel the presence of my head within the room. I had waited a very long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie back down, I resolved to open a very, very little crevice in the lantern, and so I opened it, until at length a, a single thin ray, like the thread of a spider, 
shot out and fell full upon the vulture eye. It was open. It was wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it in perfect distinctness, all a dull blue, with a hideous veil over it that made the blood in my marrow run cold. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon that damn spot. Have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the sense? Now I say there came to my ears a, a very low, dull, quick sound, much the sound as a as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates a soldier into courage. But for many moments I, I refrained and kept quite still. I held the lantern motionless and meanwhile the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mock me well? I have told you I am nervous, and so I am. And now, at this dead hour of the night, amid the, the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. But for many moments I refrained and kept quite still, and the beating grew louder and louder and louder and louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now, now a new anxiety seized me. The sound, it, it would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and I leapt into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed upon him. <laughs> I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. <laughs> but for many moments the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It, it would not be heard through the walls. <laughs> At last it, it ceased. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. The old man was dead. I placed my hand upon the heart. I, I held it there for many moments. He was, he was stone, stone dead. I felt for the beating. There was no pulsation of any kind. The old man was dead. His eye. <laughs> His eye would trouble me no more. <laughs> if still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe to you what wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned and I worked in haste, although in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then removed three floorboards from the scantlings. I then replaced the dismembered body between the scantlings and replaced the floorboards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, <laughs> not even his, could have detected that anything was wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no blood stop, spot, no stain of any kind. I had been too wary for that. <laughs> A tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went downstairs to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered two men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. 
Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police station, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I bade the officers welcome, for what had I now to fear? <laughs> I bade them search, search well. The old man was, a, was away, absent in the country. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. I bade them search, search well. I, I took my visitors all over the house. At length, I, I brought him into his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure and, and undisturbed. At length, I, I, I brought chairs into the room, and I bade them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own chair precisely upon the spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victims. The officers were satisfied. My, my manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. I, I sat and while we chatted, I answered cheerily. But all along, I felt myself growing quite pale. My, my head ached and I, I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still the men smiled and still they chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It, it continued and became more distinct. I, I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and it, it gained definitiveness until I, I realized that the sound, the sound was not in my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale. But still they sat and chatted, and, and what could I do? It was the, the low, dull, quick sound, much the sound as a, as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I arose and, and argued about trifles in a high key and with violent gesticulations, but still the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I, I paced the floor to and fro with, with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observation of the men, but still the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? <laughs> I foamed, I, I raved, I swore, I, I swung the chair upon which I'd been sitting, I, I grated it upon the floorboards, but the noise, the noise steadily increased and arose over all, louder, 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 I thought the, the noise would burst my head and, oh mighty God, was it, was it possible they heard not? No, 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 they, they heard, they suspected, they knew, they were, they were making a mockery of my horror, this I thought and this I think, but, but anything was more tolerable than this horror, anything was more bearable than this derision, I could, I could bear their hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that, that I must scream or die. And now, hark it, louder, louder, louder! Villains, villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more, I admit the deed. Here, here, tear up the planks. <laughs> It's the beating of his hideous heart. <laughs> the Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. I'd like to share with you now um, probably Poe's most famous poem, um, done in 1848, just before the time of his death, uh, The Raven. And uh, 
It is said the, uh, when he would uh, go before his audience and, and uh, he would recite his poetry, he, he was a very dashing kind of fellow, even though he was kind of disheveled. But the lady lo ladies love Poe. They would line up in the front of the audiences and they would just swoon as he would recite his poetry. And um, The Raven is his uh, mark of fame to his life. Uh, probably it's the, his best known poem, one of the most best known American poems. I. I venture to say. And um, Poe was uh, surrounded by a lot of death in his life. Uh, he lost a lot of loved ones uh, around him. And um, it's kind of a, a, a poem that harkens to that, all the loves that he had lost in his life. In the, uh, in the story there is, a, a, in the poem there's a woman, Lenore, that he is lamenting on this particular night. And he is visited by a raven. Uh, he doesn't know whether it's heaven sent or hell sent, but this this raven visits him on this particular night, and um, it um, it is a, a haunting uh, experience that this person has in this poem. And so, without further ado, uh, the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. We have a raven. <laughs> Once upon a midnight dreary. While I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. As I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Just a visitor, I muttered, rapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was the bleak December and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow. Vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrowed for the lost Lenore, for that rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain filled me, thrilled me with fantastic terrors never known before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I, I stood repeating to some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, merely this and nothing more. Deep into the darkness peering, Long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token. And the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word Lenore. Merely this and nothing more back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon there came a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely there is someone at my window lattice. Let me see what thereat is and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a moment stopped nor stayed he, but with mien of lord and lady perched above my chamber door, perched above a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven, wandering on the nightly shore. Tell me, tell me what thy lordly name is on this night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marvel this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though his answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For one cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon a sculpted bust, just above his chamber door with such name 
as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on that placid bus, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word it did outpour. Not a feather then he fluttered, nothing further than he uttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he shall leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Surely what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master whose unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hopes that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, soon I, I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose Fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining which the lamplight gloated o'er, on whose velvet violet lining which the lamplight gloated o'er, she shall press ah, nevermore. Then we thought the air grew Denser, perfumed by some unseen sense, a swung by seraphim whose footfalls now tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God has sent thee. By the angels he has lent thee. Respite, respite, and nepenthe, and forget thy lost Lenore. Quaff, oh quaff, and forget nepenthe, and forget thy lost Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether temptest sent thee or, or whether temptest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land, enchanted in this home of horror haunted, tell me, truly I implore, tell me, is there balm in Gilead, tell me, truly I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by the heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word a sign of parting. Bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting, get thee back into the tempest and this night's Plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave thy memory unbroken, quit thy bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's who is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming casts his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe.
I don't want to leave you all this evening feeling very heavy with all, with all that you've just heard. So we're going to have a little fun right now. After all, Halloween is just around the corner. You guys look like you're in the mood for a little bit of fun, right? Okay, okay, very good. Well, we're going to sing a little song together. I hope you brought your singing voices with you. <laughs> we're going to sing a little song together. Uh, now you all are familiar with um, My Darling Clamming Time, are you not? You're all familiar with that song. And you're all familiar with the, the refrain, Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling Clementine, you are lost and gone forever, dreadful sorry Frankenstein, uh, Clementine. Well, we're gonna change the, the verses a little bit. It's gonna be My Darling Frankenstein, okay? In our honor of the holidays, okay? So when the refrain comes, it's Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling Frankenstein, you are lost and gone forever, dreadful sorry Frankenstein. Okay, let's begin. <laughs> I was working with my test tubes in my laboratory fine when I dropped and broke my glasses and created Frankenstein. Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling Frankenstein, you are lost and gone forever, dreadful sorry Frankenstein. He was made from different bodies, bits and pieces through and through, held together with elastics, paper clips, and Elmer's glue. Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling Frankenstein, you are lost and gone forever, dreadful sorry Frankenstein. He was moaning, he was groaning, as I stitched his head on tight. Then when lightning struck his forehead, both his eyeballs lit up bright. Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling Frankenstein, you you are lost and gone forever, dreadful sorry Frankenstein. He was tumbling, he was stumbling as he sauntered across the floor. He had never seen a doorknob, so he crashed right through the door. Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling Frankenstein. You are lost and gone forever, dreadful sorry Frankenstein. He went raging through the village from the forest to the sea, till he finally took up refuge in some lady's bakery. Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling Frankenstein, you are lost and gone forever, dreadful sorry Frankenstein. Frankenstein helped in the kitchen as he helped her bake a cake, but he fell into the mixer and got mixed up by mistake. Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling Darling Frankenstein, you are lost and gone forever, dreadful sorry Frankenstein. Baking nicely in the oven, oh that cake it came out fine. She told her friends those lumps were raisins, but the lumps were Frankenstein. Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling Frankenstein, you are lost and gone forever, dreadful sorry Frankenstein. Oh my darling. Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling Frankenstein, you are lost and gone forever, dreadful sorry, Frankenstein. Wonderful job. I want to thank you so very, very much. I, I thank you for sharing the evening with me. I, I love um, uh, sharing Poe with uh, excited audiences. And thank you for coming out tonight. And I, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And my thanks to the, to the Lafayette Durfee House. Thank you very, very much for having me.